Melbourne is Australia's second largest city, with a bustling population of nearly four million people. Known for its thriving sporting and cultural scene, as well as its fickle weather, Melbourne is consistently rated one of the most livable cities in the world. With such a livable city, it's no wonder that forecasts suggest the population will swell by an extra million people by 2031. So how can our transport system prepare for such growth? What can we do now to ensure Melbourne maintains its high standards of livability? In early 2011, the Moving Melbourne Seminar Series brought together thought leaders from across Australia and the world to discuss just that. Uh, Melbourne being livable is, is all about uh, connectedness and how connected we are and that's just not in a physical sense but it's also in an intellectual and social and cultural sense too and Melbourne is incredibly connected like that. The livability of inner Melbourne is particularly a great success actually. In fact the CBD itself is a huge sustainability success story. We've got employment growth, you know 50-60% employment growth the last 10 years. We have population growth way beyond that and we have places that are really quite nice to be in. The choice and the way the network is configured is probably the greatest strength that Melbourne has and if you ask anyone from, um, from another country or even interstate, they don't have any complaints at all about our system. But is this thought shared by Melbournians themselves? The fact that you can jump on a tram for most of the day up until about yeah. one o'clock in the morning and it's, it's cheap and go to really relevant parts of the city is great. If you live in the right parts of town, there is good infrastructure. In this one of the world's most livable cities, why don't we have a train to the airport? There was no tram. Then I waited for a bus for maybe like 15 minutes. Obviously getting a bus into the city took way longer, so now I'm late for work. Because you have to rely on their timetable, and the timetables are pretty consistently not on time. Melbourne is well known for its unpredictable weather. The economy, however, has been much less erratic. During the global financial crisis, Melbourne weathered the storm better than most. But the forecast for the next 20 years is anything but clear. We asked the Moving Melbourne speakers what they saw as our key challenges. The biggest challenge for our transport system is dealing with the growth that we're predicting for Melbourne and being able to pay for it. A great challenge we have is our railways are full now. They really are extremely popular and they've never had usage as high as they have now. And what about those areas without access to the rail network? From a geographic perspective, Melbourne is huge, nearly five times the size of Greater London, with roughly half the population. We have a trend towards low-income groups living on the fringe of the city, and they tend to have a much greater access challenge and be highly car dependent as a result. I fear for their future as petrol prices grow in, in size as a result of you know, depletion of oil resources. Uh, I fear that the scale of the city won't survive and many of the shocks that we're likely to face in transport in the future. We've got a city which, which ranks up there as one of the most livable in the world, but it's up there for, I think, for, for other reasons and it's, it's certainly not up there for, um, for sustainable travel, if you like. When people use public transport, it's because they have to. Nowhere in the planet will people use public transport if they can use their car. I mean, I think, of course, we have to improve public transport as much as possible. Mm -hmm. But uh, even if we have great public transport, if we don't have more obstacles to using the private car, it would not happen. Deciding what to do is difficult because of uncertainty about what might happen, because the demands on the available resources exceed what's available. We haven't got all we need to do everything. And because the cost of choosing one option or one pathway are the lost opportunities from abandoning the alternatives. Now we can all be very wise after the event. The challenge for all of us I think is to be proactive in how we manage that risk. We need to understand our assets and manage accordingly. Congestion pollution and the rising cost of petrol are all going to make a culture of car travel unsustainable in the future. But what can our friends from overseas teach us about addressing our transport challenges? London or New York I think are very livable 
they have fantastic cultural activities, people are in the street, there is a lot of, there is a sense of belonging. There are many small businesses, local restaurants, local business. A couple of months ago I was in Saudi Arabia on the Hajj in, in, in Mecca where we take, we get six million visitors in a town the size of Ballarat. Uh, now no one there says, oh well, everybody should use the car, wouldn't it be great? Yeah, we'll get six million people to use the car, it'll be so very efficient. You ban the things, it's obvious. You use high quality transit. These guys are buying a, building a Shinkansen and a metro in the last year. They've been building this thing and they're gonna build four more new metros, but you know, that's what you need. I think we can do some better things with how we use buses. So this is how they handle buses in Copenhagen and you think about how we handle it here with the big uh, pull-in bays that uh, knock out parking. Um, they require the bus to move across the bike lane in our case. Um, they require the bus to get out of the traffic and then get its way back into the traffic again. Actually, this system benefits the passenger who gets on on a platform, it benefits the bike rider, <coughs> the bus driver, and the only person who misses out is the motorist who has to agree to travel at the same speed down the road as the bus. A city that looks everybody in bicycle, but we must not forget that these guys in the Netherlands or Denmark have a higher income per capita than the United States. It's not because they are poor that they go by bicycle. Given these international experiences, it's clear there are many paths that we could take. But which ones are right for Melbourne? The Moving Melbourne speakers offered up what they saw as our priorities. We need to build and shape our cities differently. We need to shift our, our thinking from what we're, what we're used to today, from the status quo, and think about the way that we want our cities, um, our communities into the future. Public transport. Well, obviously, I'm a professor of public transport, so I support the thing. But, you know, you just got to look at the numbers. This is a photograph I took on Collingwood Town Hall here. There's four buses there. And, and this is one of the interesting things professors get to do. I counted all the cars into the distances. Yes, uh, hours and hours of patience. And there's more people in those buses than in every single car in this picture. Cars are incredibly space uh, inefficient. This is the uh, railway tunnel we're hoping to build, Metro One. Uh, one railway tunnel with the equivalent of 24 freeway lanes, six Westgate freeways. Now, no one in their right mind is going to actually suggest that the solution to our problem of getting into Mel the centre of Melbourne is to build 24 more freeway lanes. It's obvious that we have to be efficient in what we do. Another thing we can do is to reduce the total amount of travel that is required, reducing the need to make trips. A CAD or, or central activity district uh, is designed to provide an opportunity for people to, to work uh, and uh, live closer to their employment uh, centre or their social centre. We were trying to leverage and optimise the opportunity there for residential uh, development, increased residential development, and also then uh, employment opportunities, and also releasing the burden out of the taking the burden out of the transport system by having people closer to their jobs and closer to their social and cultural opportunities, what they want to do. Not all congestion's a problem. In fact, I'd be real worried if we didn't have some congestion in our networks. It would mean that we've massively overbuilt. Whenever you've got a system with very uh, variable demand, some congestion is a good thing, not a bad thing. So the question is not how do we get rid of congestion, but rather how do we contain congestion to the right level, by which I mean the level at which we strike the right balance between ease of mo uh, mobility and access on the one hand and investment in infrastructure and systems on the other. If we look at roads for instance, uh, there's a technical solution and one of those solutions is to provide a managed motorway concept which is improving traffic flows on our existing networks. It's trying to sweat the asset to use as much as we can out of our existing uh, assets and I think that's really important. Uh, there is a second part to that and that is through uh, a road pricing technique and that's to try and manage the demand through road pricing and I think that's got to come in into the future. In the past, we've built our way out of problems. We've increased the size of our freeway systems and our road systems. And actually, this has tended to actually generate more travel. I think the way we need to change is to change that mode. To think about, you know, um, restricting travel, reducing the scale of travel, finding alternatives to travel, and alternative travel modes to what we're used to. 
uh, such as improving the railway system, expanding the bus system. I think there's a, lot, a very big role for more walking and cycling uh, for many reasons including health reasons. Um, and the types of environments that have attractive walking and cycling places are attractive for livability, you know. In the coming years, Melbourne will face many challenges. But the lessons learnt during Moving Melbourne are that with forward planning, communication with the international community and innovative thinking, Melbourne has the potential to not only meet these challenges, but to exceed expectations. But we must act now. As managers and in whatever area we're in, that's what we should be about, just trying to do things better. I think Melbourne is a, a wonderful city, but beyond it, the good things it has, what is uh, very impressive is the energy, the clarity, the determination with which they are advancing towards a better city all the time. So in some cities, the sensation you get is that the city will be the same in 20 years. Here in Melbourne, clearly, it will not be the same. It's better every day. Perhaps it is this drive that has made and will continue to make Melbourne one of the most livable cities in the world. <laughs>